Now we resumed thinking about um, this two form, the Faraday two form F, which combines E and B, and uh, so the df equals zero means two of the homogeneous the homogeneous Maxwell's equations. Well, um, it turns out if you think about if you know an, uh, about um, where this these two l equations lead, um, and so I'm going to assume that you've seen a bit of that. Um, they lead to what's called the vector potential. Um, and there's also the scalar potential that comes into that story. And I want to just give the form version of that. It's, it's uh, again, incredibly elegant. So um, it really comes down to d, if df equals 0, f is closed. I'm going to use this terminology. I haven't used it too much before. So that says f is closed. We might hope that it's dA for some one form. And that says f is what's called exact. Certainly, if it was dA, then d squared equals 0 is going to say that df is equal to 0. And very often, a closed form is necessarily exact. And I'm probably going to give make some videos about when that's not true. It's very, 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 very interesting. Um, so it turns out if, if f is nice on all of our four, we haven't taken anything out of our four, like lines or planes or something like that, then it's going to be true. OK. So um, let's actually just write down this equation, f equals d, oops, capital F equals dA, d of, and of course a is just going to be a naught dx naught plus a1 dx1 plus, let's be smart and actually copy and paste. So I'm just going to write down the general one form, that's 2, uh, in four dimensions with the x naught being starting. Okay. And I'm just going to write down what d of that is. OK, so I'll start it out, and then I'll, I'll steal it. Uh, the derivative of a naught with respect to, OK, we're going to get an x1, and then times dx1 wedge dx naught. And we know that's going to end up being negative with my usual convention for how we write these things. Plus, how's that going to continue? Well, we're going to dx no, uh, derivative a naught with respect to x2, for example. A dx2, that's going to get switched to be a negative when we co collate it together. Plus dx, da naught dx3. And then we're going to start taking the derivatives of the a's, the a1 through a2, a3, and the non-time component. So now we know, when we write x naught, we really could write t if we want to. So you can definitely think of it as t from now on. We want to remember that x naught is time. It'll stop being coy about that. OK, so let's just go ahead and steal it from down here. I think I did a version of this. OK, yeah, let's just steal this whole thing. So we're going to write out f explicitly. I don't need that. Here's f written out with the e's and b's. And then here's what we get. So for example, the dx naught dx1, we're going to get a minus da naught dx1 from here. And then this one, we're going to get a1 derivative with respect to x0 with a plus sign. And so we get six, of course, there's got to be six components for this two form in R4, six pairs of derivatives. And what are we saying? Hmm. Well, for here, for example, we're saying that minus e1 is this combination of derivatives. Minus e2 is this combination of derivatives. Again, it's a little hard to parse what that's going to do until, again, we look at uh, x naught as special. So for example, minus e1 is going to be this combination. OK. Well, so we've got a time derivative, and the ones match here. And the same thing is going to be true. Let me just put uh, minus e2 is going to be this. I'll just break it out real quick. Minus e3 is going to be this guy. OK. So these guys are just the 1s, 2s, and 3s match. So I've got, I can think of the a123 as a vector in space, the space coordinates. And I'm just taking the time derivative of that to get the e's. Plus, or mo well, plus really. And then I'm taking well, this one function, and I'm taking the gradient of that sucker. OK. So that can be summarized uh, as the vector field E, oh, now I'm going to be in bold, OK, is equal to, oh, 
need a fraction. The time derivative of the vector field A, let's bold that, uh, and that's a negative. OK, because of the mi we push the minus sign over. And then plus the gradient of A sub 0. Interesting. Now, if you know about how uh, the vector potential works in electrodynamics, this should be starting looking familiar. Now, what about, um, actually, I don't really need this. B, how is that going to relate to A? Let me just erase all this. OK, the, that's actually more straightforward. B1, for example, that's this, matched with dx2, dx3. That's just the standard combination of derivatives of A that you'd get for the curl. We do have to check the sign, but it is actually correct. When these things are, the, the top to bottom is reverse cyclic order, then it actually uh, should be positive for the curl. And so this is exactly just curl of A. And that's something, if you've gone through uh, kind of a second level electrodynamics class, that's exactly what we get. If A is the vector potential, that's how you generate B out of curl A. And the reason that you can do that, usually, when this works, is that B is divergence free. And then it means that usually it's a curl of a vector field. And then it turns out, to make everything work out, you have to have E not just being the gradient of something. That would be, in electrostatics, E is the gradient of a potential. But you also have to um, include the time derivative of the vector potential. And so this weird combination of a time derivative of space stuff plus space derivatives of a time thing, it's exactly what you get, exactly what you get so naturally out of taking D of a one form that has time and space components. The only weird thing is that this guy, if we actually just identify this with the standard electrodynamic stuff, this would be, um, E is supposed to be minus the grad of the scalar potential. Okay, so it's a li it seems a little weird, weird, perhaps, that this four-dimensional vector field A, remember it's four-dimensional, it looks like it's going to be, let me just use a nice little notation, minus V comma A, let's say, sub 3. Uh, that's not going to work. Let's, let's put a little 3 here. Let's just call that the three-dimensional ordinary, oh, and then this is really, oh, what am I doing? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just getting confused. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this A is a one form. Uh, it's right here. Let's pull all this stuff down. And there's just a, a little issue of the signs. The A naught looks like it's supposed to be minus V. And if you think about what I said at the start of the previous video, that might start to make sense. Now this stuff is exactly what you get is if you take a three-dimensional vector field A and you tilde it. OK. OK, well, that's exactly what you get, is if you combine V and the, ve the three-dimensional space vector field A into a four-dimensional vector field. So that's what I'm using for this. This is just, it's V times the time in the time direction and, and the ordinary three-dimensional vector field in the space directions. And if I tilde that whole thing, I claim you actually get the right answer. Why is that? It's because of this convention for space-time where you put minuses on everything involving time. And again, I'm just sort of doing that by fiat. Um, hopefully in some other videos I'll eventually explain how this connects to special relativity and that that minus sign is absolutely the, the fundamental core of, of special relativity from a mathematical point of view. So this actually now makes sense. When you put V and A together like this in a four-dimensional vector, that's exactly a natural thing to do. Taking the tilde to create a one form puts a minus on the V. And then we've got the identification that A naught is minus the usual scalar potential for electrostatics. And then it turns out that making this combination is exactly what you need to do to make E still work and relate it to the scalar and vector potential. And then the B comes out of the curl. Okay. So it turns out that A here is exactly what you would do the most natural thing to combine the scalar and vector potentials and then create a one form out of them. And then the whole story of uh, how the that so scalar and vector potentials create the fields is just these four symbols, F equals DA. And that guarantees, right off the bat, that DF equals zero, since the, the D of a D is zero, D squared is zero. So 
this may look, when, when we work this out, this may look complicated, but remember what's going on here. It's only complicated because we're forcing ourselves to think about this in coordinates because we have a previous version of it, like with this vector calculus stuff. Once you're done with that, then this is it. df equals 0, f equals dA. And as long as you have some intuition for d, which takes time to develop, that's all you need to know. And if you want to break it out in coordinates, you always can. And the rules for those coordinate calculations, as always with d, are incredibly straightforward. They're just always, always, always the same rules. Got to be careful with signs, but they're always the same rules. All right. And I, um, so we've seen a tiny bit of the sign change now with the tilde. Next video, we'll really look at the effect of the sign change on the star. And then we're going to do things like calculate star d star f. And you can probably guess what's going to come out of that.